Hello and welcome to the Archbishop's Corner. This is where we meet each week to talk with Hartford Archbishop Leonard Blair about faith, morals, the life of the church today, and how the gospel makes sense in an ever-changing world. This is where we go to find the answers to our lingering questions about the teachings of the church, living the faith life of a Catholic in contemporary society, and developing a stronger relationship with God. I'm Father John Gatzak, with many questions that you and I will ask Archbishop Blair as he responds to what matters to you in the Archbishop's Corner. Out in a fishing boat, empty and exhausted, Peter discovered the wonder of God's second chance. One day Jesus used his boat as a platform. The crowd on the beach was so great that Jesus needed a buffer, so he preached from Peter's boat. Then he told Peter to take him fishing. The apostle-to-be had no interest. He was tired. He had fished all night. He was discouraged. He had caught nothing. He was dubious. What did Jesus know about catching fish? Peter was self-conscious. People packed the beach. Who wants to fail in public? But Jesus insisted, and Peter relented. At your word, I will let down the net. This was a moment of truth for Peter. He was saying, I will try again your way. When he did, the catch of fish was so great that the boat nearly sank. Sometimes we just need to try again with Christ in the boat. In the Archbishop's Corner is the best place to get the encouragement to try again. And Archbishop Blair is the best person to provide that encouragement based on faith rooted and grounded in the words of Jesus, let's go fishing. Failures are fatal only if we fail to learn from them. So thank you, Archbishop Blair, for inviting us into your space, into the Archbishop's Corner. And we have a guest with us, Bishop Juan Miguel Betancourt, the Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Hartford. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Since we have you both with us, you know, we're, we are in close proximity to Christmas, just five days away. So besides worrying about last minute shopping and the Christmas dinner menu and everyone's vacation or vaccination status, what should our thoughts be focused on? Perhaps, uh, Bishop Betancourt, you first. Uh, well, thanks, John. I think all these things, as I was mentioning to one of our communities in the Archdiocese this Sunday, this past Sunday, all things are good as long as, you know, we keep you know, our family and religious values, you know, ordered uh, as the first thing, preparing ourselves to celebrate Christmas, receiving one more time Jesus in our hearts, recommitting ourselves to our Christian faith, being grateful for the things that the Lord has given us during this year, and then putting ourselves in the hands of the Lord for the graces that he wants to give us in this new year that he, with his grace, is about to grant us. So that's the most important thing. Once we have that, then... Um, all the basic stuff that we need to do for, for good celebration of Christmas with family and friends, um, that will come, you know, hopefully, you know, to a good end as well. And everybody will have, you know, a better Christmas after all that we have experienced for the past two years. Archbishop, we seem to get bogged down every year in in our preparations for Christmas. You know, the, the shopping and the cooking and everything else that goes along with a family celebration of Christmas. How do we extricate ourselves, do you think, from all of these things that we have to do and we find pleasure in doing them, but how do we focus on the real meaning of what Christmas is all about? Well, as the bishop was speaking, uh, something came to mind that uh, I'd like to say, but first let me uh, answer your your direct question. I would say when, when I was a kid, yes, of course, uh, we had uh, Santa Claus and we had gift buying and everything, but it, but it was so infused with the religious sense of Christmas, with all the, the ethnic and Catholic traditions connected with Christmas, that I don't think it was overpowered by the materialistic sense. But everything has become so commercial and people, so not all certainly, but many people, the religious sense is, you know, they're not, they don't go to church. They don't, you know, Christmas cards are all about the greetings of the seasons. You can't mention Christ and you know, you're hard pressed to find cards that even depict the nativity. It, there's this creeping kind of, of materialistic, secularistic uh, uh, transformation of the of the uh, holy day. The holy day has really become a holiday. And what I was thinking, though, as the bishop was speaking, was in the newspaper this week in the news, there was a bishop in Italy who had to publicly apologize mm. that he had told the kids that there was no Santa Claus. But I saw a piece in the New York Times uh, recently uh, that was a big article about this. And I must say, what the bishop was trying to accomplish, I cannot say he was wrong. Now, maybe he, the way he said it or the, the, you know, the, the tone of it might have been too, too harsh. I don't know. But... He was talking about the commercialization of, of Christmas, in, in this case, kind of represented for, to him by, you know, the uh, Santa Claus that makes us buy gifts and gives presents. And, uh, you know, interestingly, in Italy, 
uh, Santa Claus was never a big deal because they had different traditions. You know, it was the Bafana mm -hmm. who, who distributed yeah. uh, Christmas gifts on the Epiphany in January. And but now uh, this kind of commercialized Santa Claus has made its way into Italy. And he was bemoaning that fact. And I can't say that he's really wrong about that. And, you know, we got to be careful. As I say these things, I'm not trying to um, cast a pall over uh, you know, the elements of Christmas that are more uh, material, but they have to be in perspective. And and I think for a lot of people are losing the perspective because they're losing their sense of religious faith, you know. Even Thanksgiving, if you read the decree or whatever it was by which the president, I think it was Grover Cleveland in the 19th century, established the Thanksgiving feast day, it was all about religion and about God. Yeah. And today, uh, for a lot of people, you know, they don't, they really are just kind of drifted away you know, who are you thanking? <laughs> so I don't mean, again, to cast a pall over this happy holiday, but, but I do think that when you talk about traditions and customs and the way it's celebrated, I guess the message I would want to give is very positive, that it's about Christ. It's about Jesus Christ is what it's about. When and we were growing up— part of Christmas, when, it's not, you're missing something. When we were growing up, though, there was always that religious connection, at least in my family. Wasn't it the same in yours, Bishop, Archbishop? The, the, yes, the, there was always that religious component. We had gifts. We didn't. It, it, we weren't bombarded with gifts as as young people are today, but we had gifts and we had the the secular aspects of of Christmas, the lights, the celebrations, the food, and all of that. But it all pointed to a true celebration of the birth of Christ. That's what it was all about. Why have we lost that that component today and seem to overemphasize the commercialization of Christmas today? Well, you know, we could talk about this as old guys for a long time, about things were better then. I think, though, that what we have to do is we have to bear witness to uh, the, the, the real meaning of Christmas in our own, by what we say and do. And, that's just, and, and above all, we have to do that with our people, you know, with the people who are practicing their faith and for any person of goodwill, particularly those that are a Christian, uh, to just reinforce that important message. Uh, well, I don't think that we would want to take away any of the joy of Christmas, but what we would like to do is is perhaps uh, add a little bit more of the religious aspect of Christmas into our celebrations. Now, let me ask you, Bishop Betancourt, from the cultural perspective of Puerto Ricans, was there anything special that endeared you to the Christmas celebration? Well, sure. I mean, we have we have our own uh, Puerto Rican um, traditions, you know, and, and um, events and customs. We still have, you know, very um, strongly still, yeah. you know, the, the re religious aspect um, is, a, is a time to go, you know, to church and reconnect with family and friends. We have also um, all the things that we have here, you know, in the mainland in America, which is the gifts, the Christmas tree, you know, and um, the family gatherings, the big dinners, you know, but the religious component is still strong, still influenced by this kind of, you know, secularism as well, as Archbishop was commenting. But it's a nice time to be with family. Uh, we usually pray together um, or coming after, you know, mass or church. You know, we gather as a family. We say a prayer. One thing that Puerto Ricans actually keep constantly is the nativity scene in all homes. Uh -huh. right? That reminds us always what is this about, right? The gifts are there. The good food is there. The, the family joy is there. But around the nativity scene, right? Even we have Santa Claus. I grew up with Santa Claus. But also I grew up with the gifts in Epiphany as well. Uh, Puerto Rican tradition, we emphasize a, a lot um, the Epiphany. Gifts you know, on the Christmas visit of the and on, on the Epiphany? Yeah. I was fortunate to have both days, you know, ah, yeah. Christmas and Epiphany. Uh, but it was it was also emphasizing the gift that we're going to give to Jesus, you know, a life of virtue, a life of faith, trying to be better. Those were the things that are still ingrained in families. Archbishop, what about your customs um, coming from the Polish culture? Well, similarly to what the bishop said in Puerto Rico, I mean, it was just a traditional... I won't even say Catholic because I think it was just Christian, you know, in all churches. Obviously, the Christmas carols and some of the food and things are ethnic, depending on your ethnicity. But it, it and it, of course, it always included Mass, uh, Christmas Mass. Uh, and it was all about, you know, uh, yeah, there was Santa Claus, but, it, but we all knew it was the birth of Jesus Christ. So I think no matter what your tradition might be or ethnicity, uh, in a Catholic situation, that was the way it was, and I want to say I don't, I don't think that that's lost. But in in all of our Catholic families, I think many of them, I think our church-going uh, families in particular, uh, w keep alive that sense of uh, of the, the the religious truth of Christmas. But 
for many others who are drifting away, it might be harder to do or maybe not as uh, compelling as it used to be. Today is the 74th annual Community Carol Sing at Mystic Seaport. 3,000 carolers are expected to arrive at Mystic Seaport to lead an afternoon of joyous musical cheer. What's your favorite Christmas carol, Archbishop? Oh, honestly, I don't. I don't have any one favorite. Uh, I mean, Christmas music from different countries, you know, Mm -hmm. different places. Um, And I think I'm kind of drawn to those that are a little unusual, you know, that you don't hear all the time, that can be particularly from different countries that can be very nice. What about you, Bishop Betancourt? Well, you know, I love Christmas music, you know, both in English and Spanish, and like Archbishop said, you know, from many countries too, as I've had the opportunity, you know, to be, you know, um, a couple of times, you know, in spending Christmas in different countries. So I, I have made, you know, that part of myself to how other people celebrate. But I would say, you know, as our Archbishop was um, speaking, that the one that I think, the, the very first one, uh, Christmas carol that I learned, was uh, Silent Night. And I remember me as a small kid, I learned it at the same time, both in English and Spanish. So it's always that connects me immediately when I hear it. I just go back to when I was a kid, you yeah, know. Yeah. I, you know, I, I like really Christmas music and I'm always singing it, you know. And my family is something that they begin in October even, mom and dad. Um, but I would say that one is the, the one that I think is, it's, it's the one that is ingraining me, the one that actually makes me feel like Christmas, you know, when Beautiful. I hear it. Beautiful. Well, you know, I'm a kind of a classical music guy for the most part, but not exclusively. I remember hearing a very nice modern carol by the singer James Taylor uh-huh. about Christ and how it appearing differently for different cultures and races. You know, the little uh, the little blonde Jesus and also the little brown Jesus. It was a really very, very nice, nice. A nice Christmas song from James Taylor. Thursday is International Human Solidarity Day which is annually held on December 20th to celebrate unity in diversity. It also aims to remind people of the importance of solidarity in working towards eliminating poverty. On this day, people are encouraged to debate on ways to promote solidarity and find innovative methods to help eradicate poverty. What does Catholic social teaching say about our responsibility to the poor? I'll throw that out to both of you. Well, if I could go first, I would say, first of all, that we have to have a heart for the poor and we have to have an eye for them and we have to help them. But Catholic teaching is also about justice, that the root causes of poverty in in a culture uh, need to be addressed so that people can have uh, a decent life and find a way out of poverty. Pope Francis has certainly uh, made this a very uh, central theme of his pontificate in in light of events in the world today, but he's building upon the social teaching of the church that goes all the way back, mm-hmm. well, particularly to Pope Leo XIII in the late 19th century. Uh, so this is not anything new. It's partly a charity and solidarity, but it's also partly about social justice, about working uh, to eliminate uh, the causes of poverty. Bishop Betancourt, anything to add? Yes, I want to affirm what Archbishop said, and also we, you know, the option for the poor is something that is essential to the life of, you know, the church. So it's part of what we do as it comes, you know, like like breathing, you know, uh, in a Catholic, you know, mindset that the poor and, and solidarity, compassion, you know, and mercy are there. So now it's been emphasized lately because the world has become aware of the inequality of, you know, the use of resources. The church then has opted to emphasize, as Archbishop said, the sense of justice, right? Poverty has always been there. That's why the church has always been, you know, working along the centuries, you know, on the side of the poor and to alleviate, you know, that suffering and that need. But on the other hand, now the need of appealing for generous hearts has become, you know, stronger. And, And I like that aspect of the modern church as well. Let's take a look now at our gospel reading on this fourth Sunday of Advent, the uh, 19th day of December. Today's reading is from Luke's Gospel, the first chapter, and after the gospel is presented, we'll ask you both for your thoughts on what the gospel should mean for us today. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a city of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, 
The babe in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Bishop Betancourt, what's the message of this particular gospel? It's about, you know, the visitation, right? After the Annunciation, Mary immediately, the Blessed Mother, goes to help, you know, her cousin, her relative Elizabeth, right? And then the beautiful scene, of course, of, you know, the Holy Spirit acting there between these two mothers, you know, and the two sons, you know, it's a sense of joy and a hope. The time of fulfillment has come, and these two women are there as messengers of this joy and this hope. I think that's a very good message for uh, this Christmas, actually this year, that even in difficult situations, you know, poverty, challenges, a pandemic, um, we have the joy and hope that these two women, you know, announce to the world, right? The coming of the Savior, the one who actually brings all joy and hope and peace. What you said about messengers of joy, I think is so needed. That reminds me of the fact that we just had this horrible catastrophe occur in the Midwestern states with this tornado that ravaged through, killing so many people, destroying so much property, destroying the lives of so many people. And here this gospel is talking about the joy between these two women who are to give birth in a short period of time, one to St. John the Baptist, the other to Jesus himself. Talk about what that might mean for people who are experiencing, if you will, hardship and challenges at this particular time when when many people are experiencing joy, the joy of Christmas, the joy of this great celebration that's upon us. Well, I would compliment what the bishop said with this observation that uh, this uh, gospel, uh, you know, the visitation is about what God does and it's about what we do. And what God has done here is to uh, give Mary the gift of uh, a child who will be the savior of the world and to Elizabeth, the gift of a child who will be the precursor of the Savior. Uh, but immediately, as the bishop pointed out, the response uh, is what we do. And in this case, uh, Mary immediately going to assist her, her cousin. And uh, uh, so I think, you know, the sim same is true of life in general. Uh, we look to what God does, that is to say, when people have to understand the meaning of the sorrows that, that overtake them and the disasters, as you mentioned, this terrible tornado in Kentucky, uh, that we have to have faith in God, even in the midst of these uh, terrible things. But we also have to help one another, you know. So what God does is there to strengthen us in faith, even amid the great trials and tribulations and losses of life. And we also have to think about what we do to, to console one another and to help one another uh, when these kinds of things happen. Bishop Betancourt, anything to add? I read this morning, uh, there was a headline, right? One of these um, people that suffered and has the house destroyed, he came back to his house and there was a piano in the house. He found the piano still there. He sat down and played in the piano, mm -hmm. you know, one of the church's hymns, of, you know, Christian hymn. You know, that, that talks about what the Archbishop just, you know, expressed, that even in the midst of, you know, tribulation and disaster and sadness and suffering, especially close to such a wonderful holiday, right? That expression of faith and hope of that person who are who is already now you know, probably destitute, you know, that he needs to start over, he and his family. And it's not a sense of anger or frustration. It's, a, you know, it's a sense of hope in the Lord. That actually touched me very much so, reminded me that, that, as Christians, we need to strive for that. And I think that that's what this Christmas celebration is all about for all of us, a sense of hope no matter what the challenges are that we face. Huh? Let's look at some of the questions that have been submitted by our listeners. This first one comes from a woman that wants to remain anonymous. She's from Hartford, no? She says, There is a priest at my parish that breaks the host into so many pieces. I am concerned about the small particles that are falling when this occurs, isn't it bad for these particles to fall or break off? Well, it's a little hard to answer without knowing the exact situation. Um, obviously, some people might think this is a, a minor question, but I am very concerned as Archbishop, and I know Bishop Betancourt is too, that the, we as bishops have a responsibility to see that the Eucharist is celebrated reverently and in accordance with the uh, prescriptions of the liturgical books, etc. that priests are not supposed to take liberties with those things. You know that it depends on the size of the host. Even if you have the regular host that a priest would normally use that's a little larger for, that we use at the consecration, 
you have to break that at the communion rite and a particle of it goes in the chalice. Uh, but as far as a larger host that can be broken up into several pieces for distribution with communion, that is not unheard of or it's not wrong, uh, as long as the pieces are not so minute or tiny that it, it's not suitable. Breaking a, a large host into smaller pieces is, is perfectly acceptable. And I can't really answer the question because maybe the person who's asking is referring to some specific thing that I don't, that I don't see. Pete from Waterbury says, If you walk into any Catholic church, one sees not only statues of Christ, but also of Mary and several saints. We kneel and pray in front of these statues and icons in churches or put up shrines in our homes. Why do we pray to images if the Bible forbids this? How is this not in direct violation with the commandments? May I answer that one, John? Sure. First of all, Catholics don't pray to images. We have them as representations of those who we know that are in heaven, and enjoy God's presence, in the case of the saints, and they pray for us. This is what we call the communion of saints. Right? Catholics are trained to understand that in faith formation, the life of the liturgy, and the life of prayer. We should have that clear. And I also put examples to young people when they ask me the same question. You know, Sometimes I say, open your wallet, show me the pictures that you have there. That's your mom, that's your dad, that's your sister, right? So every time that you see those pictures when you're away, you see that they remind you of those who are dear to you. Well, it's the same thing. God, in the fullness of time, wanted his son to become man. Then we have the image of God the Father in his son Jesus. So that's why it's perfectly legitimate to have pictures, images of those who are dear to us. In this case, the Son of God who saved us. And we adore and pray to the one who's represented in the image. So that it was perfectly, you know, legitimate for us Catholics to have images and statues in our churches at home because they remind us, you know, the ones who are there to, in the case of the saints, to pray for us and enjoy their company as we will do it with people, you know, that are dear to us. Mark from Beacon Falls says, the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston re-implemented a mask mandate for all public masses, including weddings and funerals, which went into effect December 18th. Cardinal Sean O'Malley issued the mandate in the light of spiking numbers of new COVID cases and the likely increase in those numbers in the upcoming holiday season. With a spike in COVID cases in Connecticut, have you considered another mask mandate in our archdiocese? Well, I have always said that we are to follow the instruction of the civil authorities in this matter. And I know some people get their dander up about that, that, that we are, shouldn't be, uh, 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 how should we say, that, we, that as a religion we should not obey the state. But when it comes to public safety and health, I have no qualms about saying that we should, uh, we should follow that, that requirement. I mean, when we build our churches, we have to follow the safety inspection uh, for, for providing drinking water or for uh, our heating and cooling systems. This is just about public health and safety. I have said we should do that. Now, in Connecticut right now, I don't believe, uh, I think it's by a municipality, but uh, mm -hmm. most municipalities probably have said that wearing a mask is not mandatory. And I have not thought that, that I should ask the priest to do more than follow the local gu guidelines. So I do know that some dioceses have done this uh, now with this new strain that's come along. And I certainly have told our priest that they should uh, encourage people to wear masks for the sake of those who have qualms about it. And they should even reserve spots in the church where there can be social distancing and masks only and things like that. But, you know, even as we speak, we don't know what direction the, the, this uh, new strain will take. Let's put it this way. No person who comes to church should feel uh, constrained not to wear a mask uh, they, they, if they want to wear one, they absolutely should. And I've told priests and ministers in the sanctuary that they are to wear masks at certain points where they're in contact with other people. But I haven't absolutely said that everybody that comes through a church door for a mask right now has to wear a mask. Alan from Morris says, I have heard many newscasters call the deadly tornado that struck Mayfield, Kentucky, an act of God. I am disturbed by this wording. The implication is that natural disasters that cause great loss of life or property damage were caused by God. I suppose people need to put the blame on someone, so God is what comes to mind. What do you think of the phrase, act of God? Well, in this one, you know, when we learn it's something that is an act of God, this is something that I learned that the, govern the governments use to designate to 
disastrous situations that were inevitable and surprising, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but that doesn't mean that they, it, the meaning there is to describe a situation like that, out of control and, um, and it came all of a sudden, right? Out and, of human control. Exactly, out of human control and unexpected. So that's what they call it, act of God. It's kind of a phrase that describes the situation. But it I doesn't necessarily what, mean that God did no. this. No, no. And, and this is something that is kind of the mystery of God, right? God actually, he's the, the provident God that sees all things and takes care of things. But it's not in the nature of God, you know, send punishments and, and disasters, you know, upon people. Uh, especially when things that this happen, you know, our God is a God of love, you know, and even if it's described as an act of God, that doesn't mean that, you know, he willed this. Uh, one thing is allowing suffering and pain, but the laws of the nature are there, which actually need to make us think, what can we do to avoid, you know, uh, situations that might conduce to this and, and be always, you know, um, I would say careful in, in, and, and ready as much as we can to provide help too when these things happen. I mean, God is the author of nature and creation has its own dynamism uh, that is wonderful to behold. Exactly. And some of those forces of nature are destructive, but it doesn't mean that God said, oh, I'm going to send a tornado to kill people in Kentucky. It simply means that these, that the, the dynamism of the, the created world is such that these things happen. And we, God gave us a, a brain also to be to, to prudently provide when we can. Obviously, the people there were taken by surprise, many of them. Uh, but that's part of the of life in this uh, fragile and and corruptible world. Act of God, as the bishop pointed out, doesn't mean that God's being blamed for it. It's, it simply was a technical way of saying that it's beyond our control. That it's something in the great sweep of of uh, providence or the or the or the the way the, the created world uh, that that we we don't have control over. Let's take one more question, and uh, uh, this perhaps is, is best addressed to Bishop Betancourt. Mary Ann from Burlington says, I've made a promise to read the entire Bible, but I started out of order because of the Advent season. I noticed that unlike the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, the Gospels of Mark and John start the Lord's story with John the Baptist. Why is that? Oh, uh, That's a very interesting question, right? So we have um, Mark, which... Many scholars believe that it was the first gospel to be written, and it begins immediately with Jesus' ministry. So it, it tells about how early the sayings and the actions of Jesus were put in writing. As we know, the gospels came with time along the first century, the beginning of second century of you know Christian era, to talk about Jesus, to describe what he did, especially for those who were newcomers to the faith. As people learn about Jesus, about his death and resurrection, which is the core, you know, of Christian belief, the new Christians started asking about Jesus, you know, in his early life, for example. And that's what we have in Matthew and Luke, written later than Mark, what scholars and theologians call the infancy narratives. The need came for the elder church to know more about Jesus, especially his origins, mm -hmm. how he was born and why, right? And that's why Matthew and Luke took to that task to put the stories of the early life of Jesus in writing for the Christian people. St. John goes a little bit further than that, knowing the other three gospels already, and he goes back to the origin, the divine origin of Jesus. And that's what we have, you know, in the first couple of chapters, you know, of the Gospel of John. I hope that helps. We've come to the end of our time together. Can one of you close the program with a prayer and a blessing? Well, I'll tell you what. Well, let's, we're going to be a team here. I'll let the bishop offer a little prayer, and I'll conclude it with a blessing. Sounds good. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together in preparation for the coming of your Son, Jesus, our Savior, during this Christmas. By the intercession of the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, give us your grace to help us prepare our heart for this wonderful time of Christmas, celebrating the birth of of the gift of your son. Keep us always faithful to you. Be mindful of our needs during this time, and especially those who are suffering, that the graces and the peace of the Lord may abide them in them as well. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you both for joining us, inviting us into the Archbishop's Corner. I just want to wish you both a very blessed and Merry Christmas. Thank you very much, Father. You too. 
and same to you and to all our listeners.